um, uh, almost as long as QM has existed, uh, and she's been a part of this community since then. So, uh, and, and, uh, so, and obviously very uh, active and engaged throughout. Um, and I knew her as somebody, as I do actually many of you who are very, somebody who was very creative and uh, engaging and innovative. And I think that that has served her well in her career. Um, she is an online education innovator and she has broad experience across our field. Um, prior to her current position as the Associate Vice Provost of Digital Learning Initiatives and Online Education, that is a mouthful, Melody, mm. um, at the University of Arizona, she served as the University's Senior Director of Digital Learning and Online Education. There, she created an Office of Instructional Design, video, Visual Design, Video Production, and Quality Assurance, building on prior experience as both an instructional designer and adjunct faculty member. She also served as University of Arizona's Interim Dean of UA South from 2016 to 2019. Where is that, Melody? That is that Sierra Vista? It's in Sierra Vista. Okay. So, and one reason she was chosen for that role is because of her unique ability to understand the demands of the non-traditional student, which is actually what she was when she was completing her graduate degrees, both online and dur during evening and weekend programs. So you have special insights, I think, that, that you brought to that uh, role as well. So let me um, stop lathering and, and let Melody take this away and uh, she promises that we'll have fun, so uh, let's let's do it. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, this is my um, patio at my home. It's less intimidating talking to you from my patio than actually standing on a stage and looking out. Um, so I, I I really appreciate you coming to my home. I am in Tucson, Arizona, where it is absolutely beautiful, and um, I chose to sit outside today because the birds. Um, are chirping and my coworker is running around chasing balls. So I figured it would be a nice place for, for me to, um, to give our talk. So let me um, start my, my presentation. Um, so let me get going here. And it is right here, I hope. Oh, there's my, my coworker is gonna start barking. Let's hope not. I hope everybody can see that. If, uh, if you can't see that, Jim, if, if people are not able to see this and they're telling me, uh, telling you, let me know. Um, but I'm gonna have fun with this. Um, Deb asked me to come in and, and talk about um, leadership. And that is what I am doing. Let me see if I can get my chat up just so I can. Um, we can see, we can see everything. You can see it? Okay, yep. great. Okay, so I'm just gonna let you take care of the chat. And then I will, um, I will talk about leaning into leadership. So um, I do like to have fun. Um, I, Mel, uh, they I, asked if you could make it full screen. I think that's the only. Let's see, how do I do that? That was JJ asking too, so. Um, making it full screen. Oh my goodness. I'm not sure I know how to do that. Is it Someone said green button at the top left. Green button at the top left. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, I think the little, like, there's like a red, yellow, and green. Keep going over the other way. The other way. More? No, the other way. The other way. Uh, the other way. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, there it is. How about that? Did that do it? It did. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So um, leaning into leadership, um, I have to say I am a reluctant leader. Um, and I'm gonna take you through kind of some um, of my journeys through my adventures, uh, and they include Quality Matters. Quality Matters has been a big part of my um, leadership experience. Uh, I started as an instructional designer and brought Quality Matters to the University of Arizona. Uh, and I'll, I'm gonna take you just through my whole journey. And I'm also gonna give you some points of, of if you're interested in going into leadership, some things that you might think about and consider as you are on your own unique journey, because all of us have unique journeys. And some of the things you're gonna hear from me are, are things you hear about leadership. But what I'm going to do is kind of weave in my own little stories 
so that you can see how it's unique to maybe where you are as an instructional designer or as an academic um, faculty or maybe you're in a, a program coordinator position and you can see that there are pathways by using these certain um, techniques if you're interested in going into leadership. So um, this is me. This is, I don't know if anyone, oh, I gotta tell you about my game and then, then we'll, we'll start with this. But this is me at Adobe and uh, this is an upside down room where they had us lay on the, the ground and then it looks like we're actually on the ceiling. Um, so the game that I'm gonna be playing with you today and Jim's gonna help me is um, behind each of my uh, points that I'm making, and I have 12 points, uh, I am going to have a picture of me somewhere around the world. Now, if any of you have played Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, this is Where in the World is Melody Buckner. And I've been doing quite a bit of traveling. I got to travel as a dean quite a bit um, for the University of Arizona. I actually went around the world in 10 days. Yeah, so um, I've, I've done a little bit of traveling, and I try to always a lot of times I'm alone, so I do the selfie thing, which my arms are pretty long, so that works out okay. So I tried to find pictures of me in selfies, and you're going to try to figure out where I am in the world. Some of them are selfies and some of them are not. Uh, and then there's one kind of a surprise one that's a little different than a location. So when I bring up the next slide, um, you're going to see me somewhere in the world. Um, if you know where I am, type in... And then before I go to the next slide, I'm going to have Jim see if people guessed where I was. So it's kind of your way to engage through this keynote um, uh, talk because I didn't really know how to engage you because we're in, in the webinar. So, so let's start out um, with, and when before I go, okay, here we go. Before I go into this, I do want to tell a quick story. I'm going to tell a lot of stories about this. And this kind of goes with this picture because I think it's pretty much kind of describes me. Um, when I was eight years old, my grandmother, um, uh, God bless her, she was quite a, um, a character, I guess. And she grabbed my palm and she goes, I'm gonna read your palm, Melody. And I'm eight years old. I'm like, great grandma, I'll read my palm. And she, she was looking at my palm and she goes, and, and I'm gonna talk in her Southern accent because she was from Tennessee. She goes, Lordy sakes, Melody Buckner. Oh, Melody Hartline. I was Melody Hartline at the time. I've been Buckner for a long. She goes, Melody Joe Hartline. She goes, you, my dear, are going to slide through life like a greased pig. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of funny, you know, when I was eight. Um, and it hasn't always been the truth. Um, but I tend to kind of live by that, that kind of notion that I, I want to slide through life like a greased pig, which is just like doing what I can and sliding along in the best that I know how. Um, so I just, and if I ever write a book, that's gonna be the name of it. So if you ever see that title someday, you'll know that that is my book. Okay, so let's go to the first picture. This is the first picture. And the, um, the point I'm gonna make on this is called taking risk. And somehow, sometimes it's hard to take risk um, but I think that we all need to be risk takers if you're interested in going into leadership. Um, I'm going to start uh, kind of where in my academic career. Uh, when I was um, in undergraduate school, um, I did get my degree in architecture. Um, it was a field that not a lot of women were in. I think three of us graduated uh, that year that were women in that program. And I was always being told, you know, it's going to be a harder trail for you. Um, I did not go the traditional architecture path. I took a little bit of a risk and I went with um, animation. I became a 3D animator. And I remember the associate dean uh, pulled me into his office and he said, you know, you'll never find a job. You'll always have to be on the boards. You'll, there'll always be traditional architects. And the pathway that you're choosing uh, will never get you a career. And I remember thinking he was kind of a dinosaur. And I, I, I got a, a really good job right out of college. I was a 3D animator and I made a pretty good salary. And I took my contract to his desk and I put it on his desk and I said, I think you're wrong. 
um, I think this is the future. And it was a risk at the time, but it ended up being a risk that paid off in my career. So I was an animator for about five years, and I think that taught me a lot of things that have helped me in my job today, which is something else you should think about, and we'll talk about that later on, is taking advantage, advantage of every opportunity and learning from where you are. So every place that you are in your career, you need to gather those learning experiences and put them in your back pocket because those will be important, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but in 10 years. And what I find is a lot of um, knowledge that I gathered in my architecture degree in my, my years as an animator, I now use now. Um, design thinking. Design thinking was something that I was trained on. I never thought of it, but now it's become a real buzzword in our, um, I guess, our, in our current academic uh, landscape. So just keep those things in your back pocket and be willing to take risk. So after architecture school, um, and I was a, an animator for five years and I gathered that knowledge, um, I did another risky thing. I, um, I quit my job and I moved to Telluride, Colorado. And I had um, the year of, you know, that book, Eat, Pray, Love. I skied, hiked, and I don't know what I did. The, well, what I did for that year is I skied uh, for uh, four months, and then I went to Yellowstone and I hiked uh, for four months, and then I backpacked Europe. And um, that was when I was 28, and it was a risk. Um, but it was one of the best years of my life, and I have so much to be thankful for about the experiences that I learned during my year of travel. Um, now, when I got done with traveling, I ended up marrying um, the man that I, I um, met in college, and we ended up traveling for the next 20 years. We lived in over 40 places in 20 years. And I didn't work much of that time. Um, well, I did and I didn't. I was a graphic designer. I illustrated some books. I published. Um, but mainly, I just traveled around and took care of him and took care of my kids. It's when we also had a family. So I homeschooled some. Um, I homeschooled our kids uh, when we lived in Italy. So I know what you folks are going through right now that are home and that have your kids sitting by you doing their work, because I did it for a whole year in Italy. And it's a challenge. And uh, my heart goes out to all of you right now who are, are having to, to work in that kind of environment because um, you're trying to get your work done, you're stressed about getting your work done, and now you have your family that's sitting there and you're having to help them through their, um, their workload. So my heart goes out to you and I, I send you the best as you're going along this. Know that this is a short time and that it will be over and we'll all be back to normal soon. So, um, at any rate, I, um, I we traveled for 40 years and then, or for, for 40 years, we lived in 40 places in 20 years. Maybe it felt like 40 years. And um, coming toward the end of that travel, my kids were uh, going to be going back to school. I wasn't going to have them at home, and I figured I needed to do something. So I did another risk. I went to the community college that was building uh, close to our, our home, and I applied to teach. And I had never taught before. Um, and it's interesting, higher education, you know, takes your resume and says, oh, you have this business expertise, therefore you can teach. Hmm. So they put me in computer science. They also asked if I could teach the volleyball class because I had taken volleyball and I said, no, I'm not teaching volleyball. But um, I ended up teaching computer science. And as I was in the classroom, I realized that I had that knowledge about um, you know, what the students needed to know, but I didn't have how to teach. Um, so I went back and I got my master's and I got my master's online. And that was a real epiphany for me because it was back in 2003 um, and people were just starting to like, online degrees were just starting to like, you know, come, come of age. And I loved my online program. I was so thankful that I didn't have to go to a classroom and, um, take away from my family. I would put my kids to bed and then I would go in and I would do my schoolwork. So I, I found the power of online education because it, it, it really touched my life. And I think that's why I've been such a proponent of online education. So I finished my um, master's degree and I was, I was um, teaching at the community college. And um, then I had another um, opportunity to go to the U of A. Um, 
But before I go on, Jim, does anyone know where I am here? I think a lot of people have ideas. Kazakhstan, Jordan, Cairo, Nevada. Someone said somewhere in the desert. <laughs> Australia, Egypt, Dubai, or Inner Mongolia. Those were the oh, Lebanon. That's it. Mongolia. It wasn't Inner Mongolia. It was Outer Mongolia. I was in Mongolia. Oh, that was uh, Ken, Ken uh, Moyer. Ken, yay for you. Yes, uh, this was a trip that we got to take to uh, Mongolia. Um, and that's my son and my husband. And uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll say it's, it was an interesting time. So, and we got to, and this is the Gobi Desert, by the way. So it was really good. Okay, so taking risk. I think I've, I've banged that point enough. Okay, here's the next one. This is learning from your vantage point. And so I'll continue my journey and you can figure out where I am. This is my friend, Michael Griffith, who I work with at the University of Arizona. So you can try to figure out where we are here. Um, so I did apply for the job. It was as an instructional designer at the University of Arizona. And this is where I'll kind of weave in quality matters. So when I was at the community college, I had attended Educaz and I had found quality matters through a presentation there. So it's really important that you go to conferences and that you learn about things because I would have never learned about um, quality matters if I had not gone to Educaz, had not gone into the session and learned about quality matters. And while I was at the community college and I was teaching and I was going through my master's and I was learning how to teach and I was like, alignment, alignment. I don't really understand that alignment. And it took me a real year to get my head around the alignment of the, the um, objectives to the activities, to the outcomes and how it all lines up. And I, you know, I kind of, I had an epiphany one time in class where I was teaching something and I realized that my activity was not in alignment with what I really wanted the students to learn. And so that really kind of, that was, I guess, you know, an evolution for me and, and thank you Quality Matters for helping me unpack that. And, and, and I have to say to everyone, please continue your professional development. Um, learn from your vantage point, learn from where you are. Um, so, and be prepared. Because as I was doing my master's degree, if I hadn't had that master's degree, I wouldn't have been able to apply for the job at the University of Arizona. It was a requirement that you had a master's degree. So I did take every opportunity to further myself with a degree with professional development because then an opportunity presented itself and I, I took advantage of that um, opportunity. So I applied to the University of Arizona Sorry, got hair coming in there. I, I applied to the University of Arizona and I got the job and I was really surprised. Um, and here's another story that I think is really important. When you go into an interview and sometimes it can be unnerving to go into an interview, especially if you're going into another level where maybe you don't feel as confident. Go in there and, and so with the University of Arizona, I went in and it was to get into the university is just crazy. I had to interview by a committee, then I had to be interviewed by the dean, then I had to be interviewed by a VP. I was like, for an instructional design job, really? I'm having to go through this. But I remember going in and I had made it up to the, the higher level and I was meeting with the, the dean and this vice president and another director and they're all sitting there. And they start talking about this job, which was an instructional design job. But as most of you know, a lot of times people don't know what instructional designers do. Kind of like we're the Chandler Bing of friends. Nobody knows what we do. And these three gentlemen were sitting there and they were talking about what they thought this job was. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting. Um, and I listened to them for about 20 minutes. They, they were talkers, they, they talked on. And at the end, I said, well, guys, um, I don't think I want this job. It really threw them back on their heels. They were like, what? Do you? And I remember the, the vice president who went on to become the president of the university. He was like, what do you mean, young lady? You don't want to work for the great University of Arizona? I'm like, not what I said. I said, I don't particularly want this job. And they're like, well, why? And then I got to lay out my whole dream job. 
And believe it or not, it, it included Quality Matters because I brought Quality Matters into the mix because I had learned about it. And I was so excited about how this could be a real game changer for online education. And at the end, the vice president, um, Gene, Gene Sanders, he sat back and he goes, hire her. And he got up and he walked out and I watched him walk out and I turned back to the other two and I said, I don't think he heard me. And they're like, no, he did. And what you just said is what you can do. So if you go into a job, a leadership opportunity and a job um, interview, and you have ideas of innovation, creativity about where to go beyond what they want you to do, I guarantee you they're going to take more of an interest in you. So that is learning from your vantage point. Okay, does anyone know where we are here? So we start with, uh, someone said Coney Island, someone said Las Vegas, and then it got quickly down to Disneyland or Disney World, and then even more detailed, Disney World or Disneyland, Buzz Lightyear, Space <laughs> Range Spin, or Toy yes! Story Ride. That's where we were. We were in Disney World on the Buzz Lightyear uh, ride. So who, who got that? Did a lot of people get there that? There are a lot of people. I'll say there's Kendall, who is actually from Orlando. So I, that one maybe. But the first one was, I think, Andrew Campbell. Oh, yay to Andrew. Okay. So let's go on to the next one. This is be kind and respectful to everybody. And um, I think most of us are. Um, I, I, I'm an optimist and I'm a girl that's the, the glass half full. I think most of us treat everybody with kindness and, and we're respectful, um, especially during this time, um, this time where, where there's a lot of anxiety going on. Um, make sure that, you know, you're kind to your faculty. They may, they may be in a place where they're just unsure about what they're doing. Students may be in a place where they're unsure. So modeling that behavior to faculty so that they can model that to their students is, is really important. The story that I want to tell you is how someone wasn't kind to me and the ramifications of that later um, in my career. So when I was um, uh, doing the master's program, and working at the community college, there was a group of instructional designers and I tried to be friends with them. I, I went in and I said, wow, I'm really interested in this career. And I think this, you know, and I'm getting a master's and they just really didn't want to have much to do with me at all. Um, they just, you know, looked like I was bad baloney or something. Every time I would walk in, I was just like, wow, they just didn't. And it was, it was really sad. And then when I got hired by the community college as an instructional designer in a whole different unit, um, I actually got a call from one of the designers who really told me I was worthless, that I didn't know what I was doing and that I shouldn't be there and that it was a real joke. And he was really mean to me. And I was like, wow, you know, what happened there? Um, Later on, um, you know, I was in that job for a while and um, I went on to the U of A and then I slowly started climbing in leadership. Well, this person later in years wanted to become my friend and actually wanted me to hire him. It wasn't going to happen. Um, and, and not that he wasn't a great instructional designer, but because of how I had been treated by this individual, I have a memory of that. And so... I guess that's what I want to, you know, that that's my story for being kind and respectful is you just don't know, you know, who the people are around you. Someday they may have a leadership position that you would be interested in, in transferring to. They might go on to another industry that, you know, you could benefit from their friendship. So that's my thing on be kind and be respectful to everyone. Okay. Does anyone know where this is? First person to uh, announce it was Penny, who said it was Portland, Oregon, uh, Voodoo Donuts, which is five minutes from my house. So I thought of stealing that thunder. So that yes. was great. Yes, I love Voodoo Donuts. We went and bought a, um, a bucket of donuts. You can ship buckets of donuts from there. So, you know, it's kind of an interesting place. So, okay. Take advantage of every opportunity. Okay, and then there's another picture for you to think about. Um, so as I was working at the University of Arizona and I was an instructional designer and I was doing some really fun things. I was applying quality matters, um, which was a bit of a, um, 
a lift. Um, the story around the Quality Matters, I brought Quality Matters to the University of Arizona, and there was a lot of pushback um, when I first brought it. And I think I was there in 2008. So 2009, for about a year, year and a half, it was, you know, they just didn't want to, just weren't interested. And then the accreditors came knocking on the door and they said, what kind of process do you have in place um, for, um, you know, online education, looking at the quality of education? And the senior vice provost at the time had heard that I was, you know, involved in quality matters. And I got called, I got called up to the provost office and uh, said, and was said, hey, can you talk to HLC about quality matters, which I did. Um, and that was the introduction of something that I had been pushing and pushing for a lot of years, or a couple, a year, year and a half, without any traction. And then all of a sudden, an opportunity came to go to the provost and present it to HLC. And now it's being, you know, now our leadership is saying, yes, this is something that you will do. And we went from having a few um, um, quality matters um, peer reviewers to now we have over a hundred. And everybody looks to Quality Matters on our campus um, as the, the way for us to really review courses, online courses for quality. And the best thing that I love about this is once people go through Quality Matters and they become a peer reviewer and they work with, with Quality Matters and attend workshops, the best thing I hear them say is, you know, this made me a better face-to-face -face teacher too. And I smile and I'm like, yeah, teaching is teaching is teaching. So it's another great uh, professional opportunity um, that uh, Quality Matters has, that brings you. Um, so taking advantage, let's see what else. Uh, oh, so here I am working as an instructional designer. And um, I found out that I could get a degree for basically hardly anything, like $25 a credit unit. And I said, you know what? I've never thought about getting a PhD, but here's an opportunity that I can take. And so I took it. I started a PhD program. And it was something I never, in, in my mind, I never, ever thought that I would have a PhD. Uh, I'm not a real scholar in that sense. I mean, I, you know, smart enough, but I'm not one of those, you know, people that I'm just like, oh, yeah, I'm a PhD. Um, so getting the, going through the process was, was an interesting one for me. One, I did love the learning. Um, I loved attending class. I loved working with uh, the faculty and the students. And it got to the point where it was time for me to write my dissertation. And I still had like two classes that I wanted to take. And I'm like, no, I, I want to take these two classes. And they're like, you're done, you're done, move on. Um, so I really loved the learning of the PhD. And then I actually fell into my, my dissertation, which I, I just, to this day, I, I still use some of the things um, that I wrote about in my dissertation. Um, I wrote about digital, still, digital storytelling as an assessment practice and study of broad programs. Um, so it, it ended up being something that kind of formed my, um, my whole career. So think about that uh, with the PhD. Um, to find something that you're really passionate about for your dissertation. That's the best advice I can give you on, on going through that process. But I took that opportunity. Um, I also, there was also some professional development at the U of A. It was called Academic Leader Insti Leadership Institute. And the first time that I applied for it, it's very competitive to get on in. They only take, uh, I think there's about 40 of us every year that they take in, in a cohort. And it's people that are going into leadership. And it was a great program. It was a year program. The first time I applied, I went to my, my um, supervisor. And, um, and it was funny because he was like reading my review because it was my review time. And I said, you know, I'd really like to apply to that Academic Leadership Institute. And without missing a beat, he says, oh, Melody, you're not leadership material. Just like that. Didn't even look at me. Just was reading my thing going, oh, Melody, you're not leadership material. This was my supervisor. And I was like, wow, I went like this. And he, he go, I go, ow. And he, he looked at me and he goes, what? I go, I think I just hit the glass ceiling in your office. <laughs> and I started laughing. Um, he it went totally over his head. Um, and so I didn't go that year. But then um, I had a different leader uh, a couple years later, and she actually nominated me, and I did go. So just because you get turned down one time doesn't mean that you shouldn't pursue it. 
um, you just might have one barrier that's in your way and maybe that barrier gets moved. So um, don't worry about that rejection, just keep on going. Okay, does anybody have any idea where this is? Yes, there were a few different guesses. Shanghai, Beijing, Kyoto, Japan, Thailand, uh, Cleveland. <laughs> I like Cleveland. <laughs> um, this is Beijing. This is uh, right outside of the Forbidden City. So Beijing. Beijing was Andrew. Andrew, yay! Okay, let's go on. <gasps> oh, this is another good one. Be persistent. That's, that's me and my husband, and I don't know. You're in a region, so think about it that way. Um, so be persistent. So I think the last story that I told was actually supposed to be for this one, and that's about being persistent. So, um, you know, when someone says, no, this isn't you, don't let that one person rule your life. Um, say, hmm, well, that, that, that's that person's perception on me, but I think there's other people who may think differently. So move out into those places where you find someone, find a mentor, um, find someone that will, will help move you up. And I have to say, I went from a, a, um, a supervisor who was more like, you know, the glass ceiling where I kept on hitting my head to a supervisor who really believed in me. And um, she saw such potential for me. And I think that was one of the reasons I was able to go into the dean position and on up into the AVP was because I had someone that I reported to that really um, believed in me. So when you're interviewing for, for jobs, really look at who you're going to report to. That's very, very important. Okay, so um, be persistent. Oh, this is a great story. So this is a story that I learned from my kids. Um, I don't know how many of you are gamers, but there was a time when I used to play World of Warcraft a lot. And um, I was doing some research on gaming and motivation theory, and I was, I was playing, and I was a, a night elf, if anybody is into um, World of Warcraft. And I remember I was playing one time, and my sons, they were either in junior high or just about to go into high school. And in World of Warcraft, you level up. So as you're playing, you collect things and you do things, um, but there's a chance you might die. And so if you die, you have to... Um, go back to your, you, you get sent back to a location and you have to go find your body and you have to resurrect it and then you, you continue on. But for me, because of, I guess, where I've, I've come from in education, it's like, if you fail, you don't get to redo, you just kind of move on, right? Because that's kind of how our education system works. And I was, I was, um, I kept on dying and I said, God dang, I keep on dying. And uh, my son was sitting there by me. He goes, well, that's part of the game. And I said, yeah, but I go, it's so frustrating to me. I don't want to die. I just want to move on. And he's like, yeah, but mom, every time you die and you have to go back, you're learning the things you need to avoid. I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, you're right. And I'm like, well, yeah, of course, that's like what failure does for you. And so it was great that this 14-year-old is teaching his mom about failure in a video game. So that's what I'm, I guess one of my points is being persistent is go ahead, die, go find your body, resurrect, and continue on your journey with World of Warcraft. Um, I think that's all for the being persistent. I think I've told my stories about being persistent. Does anybody know where we are here? So it's Mongolia or Tibet, Nepal or New Jersey. Mongolia. Mongolia. Yeah. You guys already had a hint because I was already in the Gobi Desert. This is actually <laughs> in another area of Mon Mongolia. If you ever get to go here, they've, re they've simulated um, uh, Genghis Khan's village. And this is uh, where we got to dress up in, as you can see, in his, what his clothes would have been like during that time period. Um, but we got to see the whole village. And you had to drive from location to location because all the people would have been camped out in between. So it was really um, kind of awe-inspiring to see how Genghis Khan uh, set up his, um, I guess, his empire or his village out in the middle of nowhere. So who got Mongolia? Uh, JJ and uh, Sharonda. All right, JJ and Sharonda, good for you, good for you. There's a really funny story about this. If someone wants to hit me on a happy hour sometime, I'll tell you about it. I'm not gonna do it now, so. Um, okay, so let's go to the next one. 
Oh, this is, this is a good one. Okay, so guess, guess where I am here. Okay, so this is a really, really important one. And something that I think leaders, successful leaders do all the time. And that is surround yourself with people that are better or different than you. Sometimes leaders like to surround them themselves with people who just say, yes, yes, whatever you say. And, and I don't think those are really effective leaders. Um, the leaders that, that bring people in, that challenge them, that are better than them, that, that can do things that they can't do, those are when you see really successful teams and, and leaders are perceived as, as successful. Um, so the story that I wanna tell you here is um, when I started creating the Office of Digital Learning. Um, so I was working as an instructional designer for the guy that, that I hit the glass ceiling with. I worked for him for five years and I did a lot of good work under him. He wasn't, it wasn't that he was a bad leader. I just did different work under him. But there came an opportunity where another leader wanted to start um, Arizona Online. And she plucked a lot of people from around campus. And I was one of the ones that she plucked. Um, and uh, I started building, she asked me to build this Office of Digital Learning. And I found a model that was out of Purdue. It was a paper written out of Purdue about um, how to orchestrate uh, instructional design teams. And so I took this paper, I actually called the researcher and talked to her about it and came up with a model that would work for this office. And my first hire wasn't an instructional designer. It was um, a storyteller. It was a videographer from our Arizona public media that had won 13 Emmys. Uh, this guy, and I still have him today. Matter of fact, he checked on me right before this. This um, uh, we were about to broadcast because I was originally going to broadcast in our studios and then wasn't able to because we shut them down because of um, COVID nineteen. Um, this man is incredible. He's an incredible storyteller, and he was my first hire. My second hire was a visual designer um, because I knew that telling stories and how things looked are important. And then I started hiring my instructional designers. Um, but I always tell the people that work for me, and, I, and I, I truly believe it in my heart, every one of them is better than I'll ever be. And I always say that. And I can, I, I can tell Angela Gunder, which many of you may know, um, she's gone on to be the, the vice president for um, the OLC, a vice president of learning for the OLC. Incredible, incre I mean, I get down and thank my lucky stars that I met her. Um, and I, I really feel that way about almost everybody on my team. Matter of fact, everybody on my team, not almost. Um, I have a real um, passion to help people. I want people to, to further their education. I had um, uh, one uh, candidate that applied uh, for one of our jobs. And he didn't have the right credentials. Uh, he didn't have a bachelor's degree and you, it required a bachelor's degree. But this person had so much experience. I actually called HR and I said, I want to change this because this person is so, has so much experience that I know we can get him that degree. We can help him get that credential. But he's such a knowledge source for me. And we did and we hired him and he's on my team and he's incredible. And now he's started his bachelor's degree at the University of Arizona for that $25 a credit hour. So we're gonna help him you know, achieve that degree. But in the meantime, he is giving us a wealth of information. Um, for, for what he's doing for us as a, a course support specialist. So I really do believe in uh, surrounding yourself with people um, that are better than you, but also who think differently. So I always want my staff to challenge me. I never want them to say, yeah, yeah, Melody, that's good. If I'm doing a reorg, if I'm doing something different, they challenge me all the time. And I think through those challenges, uh, we become a better team. Okay, so where do you think I am here? Lots of different guesses this time. Uh, Iceland, Antarctica, the Galapagos, um, the Falklands, Argentina, South Africa, and then Patagonia, Chile, New Zealand, someplace specific in Chile, Isla Mag Magdalena, South yes, Africa. Yes, that's it. It's that one. It's, it's the island. Uh, 
of mag I, I don't know how to say it you, you probably did it better than I did it's um right on the tip of Chile uh, going to Antarctic and it's a little island where it's all the penguins come um so that's that's who got that one Karen Karen uh Karen Garrick you, all you, right, Karen, yeah. you know your penguin <laughs> islands. And they're really loud. I have videos of these things just screeching, um, but they were really fun to watch. They're kind of little clowns. So yes, that's, that's the one. Okay, fake it until you make it. And then here's another place. Um, so I was happy working along in the Office of Digital Learning. I had the best team in the world. Um, the, the person I was reporting to, um, Vincent Del Casino, Vin Del Casino is now the provost at um, uh, California State in um, San Jose. He was phenomenal to work for. I was working for another uh, woman, Melissa Vito, who was above him. It was just like the dream team. We won an innovation award for OBSEA. Everything was just oh, it was great. And um, the, the senior vice uh, provost came to me and she goes, I need you to be a dean of U of A South. And I'm like, uh-uh, mm-mm. -uh. The story actually goes that um, there was uh, the vice provost of uh, faculty affairs came to my office and was interviewing me about U of A South. And I gave him an earful because I usually have stuff to say. And uh, halfway through that interview, he goes, how would you like to be the dean of U of A South? And I'm like, not enough tea in China, not going to happen. And uh, he's like, okay. So we kept talking and, and they said, well, we don't have to call you the Dean. I'm like, no, I'm not doing that job. And he said, okay. And so then he packed up his little notebook and he ran out. And I said, I do not have a good feeling about this. And sure enough, 45 minutes later, I get a call from the senior vice provost. She goes, I need to see you in my office. And I'm like, mm. And I went over to her office and she goes, I need you to be the Dean of U of A South. And I'm like, and I had all sorts of reasons about why I did not want to do this. Uh, and they were all valid. Every one of them was totally valid, but she saw through that. And she said, no, I, I really need you to step up and do this. And I need you to be a game changer. Um, so I changed, um, it's not U of A South anymore. Um, it is now the College of Applied Science and Technology in Sierra Vista. And we hired a consultant to come through because it was a brand thing. U of A South had a bad brand and it had bad, bad, bad brand since its inception. Um, going South, where is South? What is South? What no one knew it was just, it just had a bad reputation. So um, and it took us three years, um, but we did get it turned around and uh, it is now this College of Applied Science and Technology and they're going out for a permanent dean's um, position. It's not me, <laughs> it's not me. Um, but it was a real learning experience and I faked it until I made it. I did not know how to be a dean. Um, people were really helpful along the way, but it also allowed me to go into cultures that I wasn't normally a part of. So I was on dean's council, I was in provost council, I was at the leadership table. I got to meet with the president and the provost and all of these things helped me in my job that I'm doing now, but it was a learning path and I stumbled a lot. And, and I, I said, Hey, I'm just trying to do the best that I can do. And people understood and people were really, really helpful. So it was one of those things, um, fake it until you make it. One of those, um, one of the biggest things, and I think this is, something that's always led my academic career is when I was Dean is the student experience. And no matter what, ex what decision I made, whether it be for, with having quality matters or having a technology or, you know, implementing whatever, I always came back to what is it like for the student? What is the student experience? Because that's who we're here for. That's who I'm there for. And um, being a dean really got me to see that student experience. I got to give scholarships to students who might not necessarily be able to go without that scholarship, go to university. And, and I was kind of an emotional person. And they would always, when they got their scholarships, would have to give up, get up and, and give, um, 
you know, their story. And at the end, I would always be crying. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're always making the dean cry. And they would always laugh. And they're like, yeah, yeah. Let's see who can make the dean cry in this meeting. Because the stories were so touching. And um, they were so real. And they were so thankful for the opportunities that they were getting. I mean, I think about it now. And I'm, you know, I get a little teary about what an, what an impact we can have on people's lives through education. And um, always think about that, no matter where you go in your life, you know, how can you make a difference? And I think that's one thing that leaders really need to keep, not in the back of their mind, but in the forefront of their mind. Okay, so um, where do you think I am here? Lots of guesses on this one, starting with uh, Alaska, Patagonia, Hawaii, Torres Pine, Tor Torres that's de Pine, it. Chile. So Torres de, de Pine uh, in Chile. Well, that's not fair because Fernando, I think, is from, it lives in Chile, so he knew that one right, right away. That is, this is down in the Patagonia region uh, in, Chile, in Chile, and it is absolutely beautiful. If this is not on your bucket list, it should be on your bucket list. So yes, that was my trip to Chile. Okay. Okay, there's another place for you to guess. Listen and process before you speak. And um, I have to say, this is a hard one for me. I'm an extrovert and I tend to think out loud. My team knows I think out loud. And, and so I'm always saying, okay, I'm thinking out loud, but it's better if you're in meetings with your team, I think you're in a safer place. When you're going up the ladder a little bit to um, being in the provost council or the dean's council, I think it's really important to sit back and really listen. Listen and process before you speak. Um, and let's see what I have to say. I think it's important to have diversity ideas and, um, and to, I don't know, to really be thoughtful before you say something. Um, we're in a culture now of, you know, political correctness. So that's one thing, especially when you get to those higher levels, but also thinking about the people that are around the table where they're coming from and what their perspective might, might be and where they may be feeling the pain. And I think this is where as a leader, you need to have that emotional intelligence. Um, I was gonna tell you a story about my son, but I, I notice I'm getting a little light on time. If anyone wants to hear a really funny story about my son uh, and Buzz Lightyear, I will tell that later. It's a really funny story. Deb, you'll probably wanna hear that sometime too. So, um, but I'm gonna move on. But really, this is important. So really listen and process before you speak. And if you don't, let people know that you're thinking out loud. Because a lot of times it's good to think out loud, um, but let people know, hey, I'm thinking out loud. I'm just, this is not a, because sometimes as a leader, when you say something, people are like, oh, okay, God, she wants us to do that. <laughs> and, and you need to say, no, 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 let's think about this as a team. So instead of giving a directive. So, okay, where do you think I am here? Again, a few different ones, Washington, D.C., uh, China, Long Beach, Japan at the Cherry Blossom Festival, uh, and that's it. Okay, it is in Washington, D.C., um, and this is at the Cherry Blossom um, Festival in Washington, D.C. Who got that? All right, Lori was first, and then All right, Melanie. Lori. So those are, those are the two right, right away. And Lori, and who else? Um, Melanie. Oh, Melanie. All right. Yay. It's beautiful. If you ever get to go there um, during the Cherry Festival, uh, Cherry Blossom Festival, do go. It is absolutely gorgeous. Okay. Okay. Now this is a different one. This is not where I am, but who am I with? <laughs> and, the, and I did this for Lighten Up. And sometimes we get so caught up in in, in, in the serious work that we do, and, and the work that we do is serious, and I don't want to make light of that, but sometimes we need to just sit back and go, okay, let me just take a breath. Let me take a step back. And the story that I want to tell you was um, I was working at the community college, and uh, I was on one of the campuses, and the server was down on that campus. No one had access to the internet. The computers were all down, and 
And I was like, oh, I better see what's going on in IT. So I walked over to the IT building and I walk in and I see people frantically running around, you know, trying to get everything back online. And in the office, there's a supervisor and his name is Butch. He and I were good friends and he's like the supervisor of all IT. And he's sitting there and he's just calmly working on something. And I'm like, Butch, I go, yeah, aren't you in panic mode? I go, the servers are down, nobody's on, you know, anything. And he goes, Melody, sit down, let me tell you a story. And he kind of sits back in his seat. And I'm like, oh my God, what's this guy doing? And he said, you know, he goes, don't worry. The servers will come back up. We'll have everything by the end of the day. I've got people working on it. He goes, but before I came to this IT position, I was a safety inspector at a mine uh, just north of Tucson. He said, and one day things went really bad at the mine and there was an explosion and two of my guys died. He goes, that was a stressful day for me. He goes, this, he goes, nobody's going to die because the server's down. He goes, we'll get the server back up. Everything will, everything will come back up. And I'm like, wow, that really puts things in perspective, Butch. And he goes, yeah. Now, in the climate that we're living in, we have a lot of stresses, especially with this COVID-19. People are dying, and it is stressful. And my heart really goes out to our, our medical workers and our, our first responders and to everybody that's dealing with this. And that's, that's pretty serious. But there's sometimes when things are happening that you put stress on yourself that you're like, let me just step back a little bit and let me solve this without being in a panic because right at the right at the moment no one's in danger um, and we can move on and I find that happens in a, in a lot of um, you know higher education and in the academic world so I always think about that when uh, when I'm really stressed about you know something that oh you know the faculty aren't responding to email in 48 hours oh my god what am I gonna do okay let's just step back and, and let's um, let's figure this this process out um, another thing is on, on lightening up and also um, about kind of failure, and the story probably should have been in failure, is um, last year I applied to be the, the VP of online education and distance education. And I was one of the three finalists and I had to get up before all of campus. I thought I did a really good job. I thought I was a good pick. I didn't get the job. And um, they called me in and they said, we're not going to, we're going to fail the search for the VP. We're going to go out again. We're going to redo the job description. They said, but, but you impressed us in your interview that we want to create a new position for you called this associate vice provost of digital learning and online initiatives. And honestly, it was my sweet spot. Um, there were things that we're about to, we just hired a VP of online education. He'll be starting next month. And I'm so glad I don't have that job. Um, because leadership was right. Um, there were parts of that job that I would have been totally stressed over and it just wasn't for me. But the job that they created for me was my sweet spot. And I absolutely love what I'm doing now. And I'm still able to do all the things that I love that were a part of that VP job and some other things. So they gave me a research agenda. Uh, they gave me some, um, some other things, doing some faculty things. Whereas as the VP, I would have been more on the business side, which would have been a stretch for me. I think I could have done it, but it would have been more stressful. So just because you, you go for a leadership position and you may not get it that time, think about other opportunities that may present themselves um, with that. So be persistent. That's actually from the persistent point. Okay, does anyone know who this is? It's either Sonic the Hedgehog or Pete the Cat. It's Pete the Cat! <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people guess that. Only one person guessed Sonic. So the first person was uh, Bethany Single. Bethany! Yay, Bethany! Yeah, Pete the Cat. Um, you know, another thing that I think it's important for leaders to do is get involved in things outside of your university. Um, so I volunteer to uh, read for preschoolers uh, once a week. Um, I go into a, a preschool um, that's with a group called Make Way for Books. Um, they, they promote um, early childhood literacy. And um, my mother was a storyteller, so I'm a storyteller. So I go in and I read um, to preschoolers. It kind of gets me out of, you know, the higher ed thing and into another environment. Um, it's also good to serve on boards. Uh, if you're asked to do things, step up. 
um, say, yeah, I would be willing to volunteer and do some work in the community. Um, I serve on a board, on a couple of different boards that are outside, and I find that in that in um, informs uh, what I'm doing uh, in my leadership position at the university. So, Pete the cat, woohoo! Okay, here's another one. Be thoughtful, innovative, and positive. Um, I think this is really important. Um, probably more than anything is when you walk into meetings, um, it's walking in with the can-do attitude, even if you're like, this is the most ridiculous meeting I've ever had to attend in my life. And believe you me, I think we've all had those. Um, walk in with a positive attitude, enjoy the people that you're in there with, even if sometimes, you know, they, they may not be your favorites. Um, do the best that you can with that positive attitude. Come in with innovative ideas, even if they get shot down. Um, I always have this thing with um, uh, folks when they're always throwing darts at my ideas and are throw, and I'm like, you know what, if you're gonna throw a dart at one of my ideas, you better have a sticky note attached to it with a, with a better idea or a better solution. So, you know, don't let that bring you down. Um, come in with ideas, come in with good energy and be thoughtful about what you do. Um, with that boss that I had for five years, uh, I used to have a thing, cause I, I don't really care sometimes if it's my idea, I just, I think it's a good idea and I think it should be implemented. So I would do what I called P squared. And P squared is you plant a seed, then you pee on it, and then you walk away. And then two weeks later, that idea has germinated because it's not your idea, but it's the person who, um, who you planted the seed on. And when I say pee on it, sometimes you have to say, eh, that'll never work <laughs> and walk away from it. And it's amazing how sometimes those ideas will really take hold, germinate and flourish. Um, so that's be thoughtful, innovative and positive. Okay, does anyone know where I am here? We've got Tanzania, Kenya, the San Diego Zoo, the Congo, or Zimbabwe? Oh, no one got this one. Um, this is in Botswana. Um, I was at a game reserve in Botswana. Uh, we were at the University of Botswana, and I got to do a little um, one-day safari and found this old male giraffe um, out and watched him for about a half an hour. It was fascinating. Okay, so I stumped at least one I got a stump on. Okay, so find your passion and be passionate. So this one I, I think is really important that you, um, you find what you love to do. I think there's that book, color, go color your parachute or some the color of my parachute. There's been all sorts of books on this. But sometimes I don't think we take it to heart. And I've always been passionate about what I do, whether it's um, reading to children or going into a dean's council meeting or you know, working with students. I always try to find passion in it. And I'll tell you a very personal story. And it's kind of a sad one because I'm not really sure how to solve it. So if anyone has a way for me to solve it, um, I'm, I'm all ears. Um, I have two sons. Um, one of them graduated from the University of Arizona, and he um, he graduated in retail and consumer science, and he got five job offers um, right out of school, but they were in industries that he didn't have a passion for. Uh, he's a cyclist, um, and he now he he held out, and he got his 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 dream job with Trek Bikes. He moved from Arizona up to Wisconsin, so he's in Madison now, and he's doing really well because he followed his passion. And when he was turning down those five jobs, because he got these five jobs before he ever interviewed with Trek, I was like, oh, what are you doing? Just get a job. Uh, and he's like, mom, I, I'm gonna get a job. He goes, but I've got to find the right job for me. And so I have this son who really gets that and he's passionate about what he does. And he's, he's already looking for other opportunities within Trek to move up. So he, he gets it. Then I've got another son whose passion is music, and he's still uh, um, uh, at the university right now, and he's double majoring in uh, political science and Spanish. Um, the reason I went to, to Chile is because he did a study abroad in Chile for, um, for four months, and at the end, we went down to, um, 
we toured for three weeks in Chile and, um, and picked him up after his study abroad. This kid has a passion for music, but it's not what he majored in. He majored in political science and Spanish. He's fluent in Spanish and his interest is political science, but his passion is music. Um, and he's like thinking about getting a master's degree. And I said, well, maybe go get a master's in music. He goes, oh, mom, then I'll just have to be a music teacher. There's really nothing, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay. And, and so he's getting, I think he's going to get his master's in, um, oh, public administration or something like that. And I'm like, what? I said, that's not really your passion. Yeah, but it's a job that I can fall back on if my music thing doesn't work out. And I'm like, oh. And, and I said, well, could you be passionate about that? Oh, no, I'm too jaded with politics and all the stuff that's going on with politics. He's like a Bernie fan. You know, he's like, you know, he's, and, and he's just like, no, he goes, I'm too jaded. He goes, I would just do it because I needed to make a living, not because it was my passion. That broke my heart. I'm like, oh, I go, well, you should go into music. He goes, well, I'll try. He goes, but most people aren't successful. So I don't think I'm going to be very successful. And that breaks my heart. So I don't have a solution to that, but that's just an example of, you know, of people finding their passion in the work that they do, because your work is pretty much, you know, you have your family and you have all these things that are also very important in your life, but your work tends to take up a lot of your time. So I think it is, is pretty important. Okay. So where do you think I am here? It better be Cape Town, South Africa, uh, <laughs> because that's what everyone said. <laughs> That is it. That is, I'm on Robbins Island uh, looking toward uh, Cape Town. I think it's Table Mountain. So. Yeah, Natasha, Natasha called it at Table Mountain too. Natasha, yay! Okay, great. Okie doke. Set goals and be willing to adapt. So the story I just told you, that's my son who works for Trek. Um, and I just kind of gave away where this is, but um, I had to put one of these in. So hopefully someone knows where this is. Um, set goals and be willing um, to adapt. And I'll, I'll keep on telling you the story of, of this young man here. Um, he, uh, I'm really proud, I think all of us are proud of our kids. Um, he was an athlete in, in high school and I would say he's an average student. Um, he wasn't gonna be your one who just like lit the academic world on fire. Um, but he does have um, emotional intelligence and he, he does have a lot of really good common sense. But he didn't get into university right away. He, had, he went through um, uh, community college for his first two years. And then he, when he got his grades up to where they needed to be, he transferred to the University of Arizona. And the first place he was trying to go was engineering. And he went to the College of Engineering got a real good engineering mind. He's a cyclist. He, he builds bikes. He, you know, does all that. But um, the University of Arizona's engineering program is very theoretical, uh, very research-based. And he got through the first semester, he got through the, all the math and science, and then he got into the classes and he's like, wow, this isn't my passion. This isn't my tribe. This is not what I want to do the rest of my life. So he had this goal of being an engineer, but he found out he wasn't his passion. So he said, I'm going to go over to um, the business college. And I'm like, oh, God, don't drink their Kool-Aid. And he went over. And of course, he came back and he's like, I'm an LR student. I'm like, oh, you drank the Kool-Aid. Um, and I said, well, OK, see how you do. He didn't last a year there. Uh, he's like, these people are not my tribe. Um, he said, I'm not in a fraternity. He goes, I hate the Greek, you know, the whole Greek system. He goes, I'm just really not into that. He goes, it's it's there's just a lot of issues in the business college that he really wasn't willing to adapt to. So I told him, I said, you know, there's this program over in the college of applied science, not implied in um, uh, the college of um, agriculture and life science. It's called uh, retail and consumer science. And I go, why don't you go check it out? He went over, he came back, he goes, oh my gosh, I have totally found my tribe. He was so excited. He excelled. He ended up um, graduating and then getting this job with Trek. But here is a young man who set goals, but when he couldn't obtain those goals or he found those, uh, those goals weren't in alignment with 
his life, alignment, like alignment with quality matters, he adjusted and continued on to success. So I think that's what all of us need to do. And I know I've done that throughout my career. You know, I was a 3D animator and then I, you know, I went on to be a mom and, and travel. And then I, I went on to go into higher education as an instructional designer on to be a dean and then, then on up to the position that I am in now. And every time I had goals set, but I was willing to adjust or adapt depending on what the world threw at me. And I think that's really important now as we're going through this change of normal. I think, I think we're gonna have a new normal coming out on the other side of, of COVID-19. And I don't know if it's gonna be a bad thing. I, again, I'm an optimist. I'm a girl half, half glass half full. So um, yeah, set those goals, but be willing to adapt. Um, does anyone know where this is? I hope everybody's gotten this by now. I hope everybody just flooded this with. Everyone flooded. There was one person who said there's a similar building uh, at Arizona State University. Uh, oh, yes, yes. But um, University of Arizona. Yes, thank you. Okay, and this is my last one. I don't know how I'm on time. Oh, I'm right at time, so good. So this yeah. is learn to laugh and enjoy yeah. life. And um, uh I think that we, we need to be really, we really need to take this to heart. Um, second year into to being a dean, I had a heart attack. And I think I had a heart attack, not, um, I, I have some genetic stuff, but at 56 to have a heart attack is, is pretty young. And I think it had to do with stress. And I think it had to do with me not being where I really needed to be. Um, I'm fine. I, I, I have two little stents in my heart. Um, and I went on to go to this beautiful place, which I hope everybody will, will know where this is based upon some other clues um, throughout. Um, but it really put some things in perspective in my life. Um, learn to laugh, uh, learn to adjust, learn to adapt, but really take care of yourself. Um, and I hope everybody is really taking care of themselves now in this stressful time. Take time for yourself, take time for your family. Um, get out, enjoy the, the outside, even if it's raining, you know, get out there and do some stuff as the, as the spring comes, um, make sure you make time to do things for yourself. I play golf. Um, people are like, Oh, are you still playing golf? I'm like, absolutely. I get out and I play golf. Um, I may have to work later in the night. Um, but I do take time for myself and I think the rest of us should as well. Okay. So I guess I'm at time. This is the last picture. Does anybody want to guess where this is? Well, we started with Australia, then Argentina and New Zealand and the Swiss Alps. But then Fernando said it was Quiernos de Pine in Chile. And Penny also said it was in Chile. So I'm guessing it's there. Yeah, It's in Chile, <laughs> yes. And that is an incredible place. Um, I hope everybody can go down to the bottom of the world someday and see this incredible park and do some trekking. So um, even if you've had a heart attack, this was after my heart attack, um, I was out trekking and, uh, and enjoying the world. So with that, I think we'll open it up to questions. So uh, I'm, I will kick this off, but first let me say that was fabulous, Melody. Uh, that was probably the most down to earth, practical, colorful, <laughs> interesting leadership development presentation I probably have ever heard. Um, and uh, you did keep us engaged because that it is, we've been, we were guessing, and even though Fernando has been cheating along the way with, <laughs> we have, uh, uh, it's been, been a lot of fun. So we have some questions and I'm supposed to kick it off. And actually, uh, my question dovetails really well with what JJ has asked, and I know Jim will, will, will ask this on JJ's behalf. My question was really about, um, you know, I loved your, your greased pig sliding through life um, um, description from your grandmother, but, but clearly sometimes you, you come up against walls and really about getting heard when ears aren't open. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, what would your advice be on that? And then JJ has a, uh, a question that maybe Jim will ask that, um, that sort of dovetails with, with that question. So Jim, do you wanna yeah. go ahead and ask JJ's? Yeah, I can ask his as well at the same time. How do you convince institutional administration the worth of quality course design and leadership, especially now it seems like the 
preparation for remote teaching is not a priority. Yeah, and I have to say I struggle with this too. I, I go into a padded room and scream sometimes because um, I am always, I always lead with the student experience. And I also uh, lead with the brand, the brand reputation. Um, so, you know, you want your students to have a good experience in a, in a quality online environment. And if they don't have that, then the reputation of your university is going to suffer. And I'm preaching this right now. And, and sometimes the, I, I, I've been reading a lot of Pooh Bear lately. I don't know, because I read to children. Uh, and there's something that Pooh Bear says, um, well, maybe they're not hearing you because they have a little bit of fluff in their ear, right? And um, sometimes you, you've got to keep on talking until that fluff falls out. And it, you know, it's like planting that seed. You have to keep on talking about it. You have to keep on pushing. Even if you don't think they're hearing you, someone in that meeting will. And it might be a new ear that will be like, oh, I think this person is right. And it might take years. I mean, getting Quality Matters on campus took me almost 18 to 20 months before they really heard it. And I mean, I was, I was stomped on a lot. And you just have to be persistent. Um, but going after student experience, going after brand reputation, those are two things that, um, that leadership will listen to. Uh, at least that's what I find what mine listen to. They finally break down. Get faculty on your side. Um, the faculty that are into the, the quality of online education. Uh, have them get an army, uh, not just you, and get those thought leaders that make a difference. There's a hummingbird that's trying to buzz me. Hopefully he won't come into my space. <laughs> Good. I have uh, two, uh, two other questions in the, in the Q&A. The first one is from Lori. Did you ever get discouraged in that wait time that you were the only one pushing QM and your colleagues just showed no interest? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can talk to my husband about that. Um, because what I, I tend to do is stay real positive at the university environment, but I come home and I am just so frustrated. And there were so many times when I would come home and just you know, tell my husband what I really thought. Uh, and I don't know how to push past that frustration except to just keep on moving uh, and keep on talking to people. If this person says no, you go to another person, you go to another person, you go to another, another person. And um, this isn't my president, but um, President uh, Michael Crow of ASU, he uses a term that I had to look up. It's called being frosty which I had never heard before. I guess I'm not out of the, I'm out of the loop, but being frosty is letting those things roll off of you and keep on uh, moving forward and keep on talking to people. But absolutely. I did get really frustrated. I did. There were times when I was like, man, I just don't know if this is ever going to go. And then, then suddenly, you know, you start pecking at that iceberg and it starts falling. That's great. One last question I have from Mark. Uh, obviously, there's still time if someone wants to add another question, but here it is. Why do you think it's so difficult to understand alignment? I'm a faculty developer, and the folks I work with struggle with this concept also. Yeah, and you know, I honestly say it took me a year to understand that. I feel I was, and and I know that people struggle with that. And now that I get it, I'm like, what's so hard about? That? But for the, the first year that I was involved with Quality Matters, I really struggled with alignment. And I think a lot of it has to do with, um, well, for me personally, I'll just talk about me personally, because I don't know, you know, everybody else. But I didn't have an education-based foundation. You know, my foundation was in architecture and in design and not so much um, methods in education. And even the scaffolding, I wasn't really... I didn't know about that. And I don't think a lot of faculty in higher education uh, are trained in educational methods or educational pedagogy or what I like to say is andragogy, you know, that, that how people learn. Um, and then the alignment, you know, it's like, okay, you have, you have those objectives or things you're trying to reach and how these activities align. And sometimes you, 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 you think you are, 
but you're really missing it because you don't have the right um, words that you're using and words are important. So if you're saying you want someone to identify something, you know, you don't, you, I'm trying to think, um, or if you want someone to it's climb, climb higher up bloom something. So you want someone to create something yet all you're doing in your activity is having them identify things. Um, I, I'm trying to think of the example that I finally got. Um, and I think it was when I was teaching computer science and I was teaching students how to put computers back together. So I had parts scattered all over the room. And then what I was asking them to do on the final assessment was not really aligned with the activity that I had them doing in class. And I think sometimes with faculty, you have to get to their discipline, you have to get to where they are and say, okay, let's look at your specific example and let's see if I can find where you need a chiropractor, where you need some, some help getting back into alignment. Um, I, I, that's the best explanation I can give you. It's just sometimes hard to get around that when it's not your background of training. Good. I, there's two more questions that came in. I'm going to flip flop these and ask this one next um, from Mansoor. Quality Matters basically focuses on course design. How do you improve the other two elements of teaching presence, like facilitated discourse and direct instruction? Yeah, and that's really good. And it, it's really important to distinguish that. And I'm always preaching that. So um, if, if a faculty or if it really, it's usually an administrator that comes to me and says, well, we'll just run all these courses through quality matters and then they'll be good. I'm like, no. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I even wrote an email just yesterday about this. And the, the administrator I was talking to was like, oh, and I'm like, yeah, quality matters just looks at that design piece. And it's really important to have a, a good design, but we need to have professional development on these two other areas. You know, how to engage students, how to do direct delivery in an online course. And I said the professional development for faculty is just as important, maybe even more important than the design. And so we have to have all of those pieces together to have a whole. And I'm constantly preaching that and I constantly protect quality matters. I do not let it be used as a sword for, okay, because it's run through quality matters. Now it's, you know, this perfect course. I'm like, no, that's not what this is about. This is a peer review process. And I don't know how many times I've said it. I feel like a broken record, but I will always be an advocate for the student experience and for taking um, care of the peer review process um, for, for QM. And I'm going to ask this last question. Uh, this is from Caesar. <laughs> Do you have any regrets in your life? So this is a little bit more general. Wow, personal. <laughs> of course I have a lot of regrets in my life. Um, and sometimes, you know, you turn those regrets, you know, I'm thinking back and, and of course I do. I, I try to turn those regrets into, okay, that was a big mistake. That was a wrong decision. What did I learn from that? Uh, you know, what did I learn from, from that? Um, and, and sometimes, you know, like not putting enough money away. Or they're maybe putting too much, much money in the market or something. You know, those things I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to recover from those. But, but most, of, most of the time, it's things that are more human, where you say things. And then you have to, you know, backpedal and say, you know what, I didn't mean that. It just came out. And, and that's a lot of you know, my regrets um, are saying things that I can't take back. That's why that one, I think that was, that was back here about, um, uh, and it's a hard one for me. It's one that I struggle with the most. I don't know where it was. Uh, it was the one about um, think before you, um, uh, listen and process before you speak. Those have probably been my biggest regrets, um, is that, yeah. And not only professionally, but in my personal life. 
Well, thank you. I, I'm going to leave with two comments that were in the chat because I know you're not uh, you're not following the the chat right right now. Is uh, one said the best keynote I've ever attended. Thank you. Aww. And then another one said I another one said I so needed this talk today. Thank you, Melody. Inspiring presentation. Thank you. Well, I am inspired by all of the people that I meet. I'm really sorry that we're not face to face. Um, I think that's the best part of going to conferences is the networking that happens. So I do hope we'll be back to a new normal that includes um, all of the face to face because I so enjoy meeting um, all of you. And I hope I get to meet you someday. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to take over sharing the screen. And I think I can do that right now. Yes. And I did. So I am going to thank everybody for attending this. Um, in, the, in the conference guide, you can see what the, the next presentations are. And uh, so in this room is leaning into your leadership, making your own adventure. And uh, 